coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. We're delaying this episode until late summer. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. We've got a good show for you today. We are going to be talking about the news from the week, including rumors about a Nintendo Direct, or lack thereof. And then on Thursday, come back, because we are going to be talking about DLC that we would like to see come to Nintendo games. But Mark, in the meantime, how you doing? I'm doing so good. Uh, Patrick, let me be the first to wish you, I guess, oh man, let me back this up. Let me be the first... To tell you, Mm -hmm. may the fifth be with you. Okay, now I don't know what that means, why the fifth would be with me. That doesn't make any kind of sense. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry you had to backpedal from realizing that we record the episode a day earlier than we release it. (laughs) I don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. uh, well, thank you, Mark. May the fifth be with you as well. Thank you. Um, I've got I've, I've got a little bit of a bee in my bonnet about the new uh, Facebook React, and I know you're not really on Facebook, um, but there is a new like emote in there where instead of just liking something or loving something, you can uh, there's a care option, and it's like a smiley face hugging a heart. <laughs> oh, as in like I uh, like you are sending hugs or to indicate that you care about the person yes. who is yes sending that status right is the who whatever they're posting that you're like i'm acknowledging that i see it i love you i don't necessarily love what's happening to yeah you. okay that's actually pretty good because sometimes you're like uh you know somebody posts on twitter like sad news and you're like am i really liking this or am i it's more just like acknowledging you know the, yeah. this person's like suffering Right. But I feel like that's what the heart is for. Like, that's what the love one is for. But I guess uh, that's that would, Facebook has decided that now we need to care instead of just loving. <laughs> uh, here's something we can all care about. My copy of Sonic Forces. Would you like to borrow it? Um, someday you should. Uh, just not right now because I'm not going to go inside that post office. Uh, but if you would like to borrow my copy of Sonic Forces, if you would like to get on the list to one day borrow my copy, all you got to do is email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. Gmail. Com. And give us a mailing address where we can mail it to you. You play it for as long as you want. You send it back. It doesn't cost you anything. It's a perfect program, or it will be again. Yes. And in, you know, it's, I think it's like basically we put the Sonic Forces borrowing program on a spaceship to deep space, and it is in stasis right now. Right. That's right. It's like the end of every alien movie. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's like, did terrible things happen previously? Yes. Absolutely. Of course. <laughs> Do we have hope for the future? Yeah, because we're dumb dums. Yeah, because we're huge dummies, and we think that Newton Hicks are going to survive to the next movie. <laughs> Spoiler, they're not. <laughs> hey, thank you to everybody who has added us as friends on Switch. Um, we can't tell you enough how much we love getting friend requests and seeing what everybody's playing and hanging out with you on our islands or your islands in Animal Crossing. If you want to get in on the fun, you can find our friend codes in the description of every episode that we do. Um, So yeah, add us. Here's one weird wrinkle. Uh, My like screen name associated with my friend code is Ace. So no, you did not type it in wrong. I'm just trying to get that nickname going. Oh, wait, uh, Mark, I am so sorry. Am I supposed to be calling you Ace? <laughs> Have I been messing Patrick, this up Patrick, for like seven years? <laughs> please at least wait an episode. So that way mm. it's not so like grossly transparent what transpired here. Okay, so if anyone is listening to this, to, uh, this show like retroactively and you're like shotgunning it all and you're just like listening to a bunch of them in a row, stop listening to this one right now and skip ahead a week and see if I'm calling Mark Ace or not. <laughs> Um, also wanted to do a quick shout out to um, 8-Bit Betty, who uh, provides us with our theme music and all the music that you hear on the show. Um, 
he has released a new single. It is a cover of Prince's Nothing Compares to You, and it is awesome. You can find it on his website, which is apitbetty.com. Uh, I have I had been plugging it at the end of these episodes, but usually as I'm like in the middle of our wrap-up, so I'm sure people are already tuning out by the time I'm plugging uh, Apit Betty's music. But please go there and check it out. It's really, really cool. It's really, really thick and sounds like Apit Betty and Prince at the same time. It's beautiful. And then finally, um, thank you to Chris and Josh for s- sending us your episode ideas. Uh, as we ended Retro Month, you know, we really enjoyed doing it. And so we're not saying that we're out of ideas. We're saying no. that we would love your ideas for yes. uh, episodes we could do in the future. So thank you to Chris and Josh for sending those over. We are considering everything. Nothing is off the table. Um, so That's right. So, you can always send yeah. in your ideas, too. Uh, and you can email us those ideas to Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. Or you can tweet at us at NinCart Society. Um, we will see your ideas there. All right, Mark, let's get into what we've been playing this week. It's May Day, or the week of May Day, or... Mayday week. What is this? <laughs> what, what is Animal Crossing? Okay, the point. Yes, it's uh, Mayday happened, and it is like mm-hmm. a mini event in Animal Crossing. And I'm a little confused as to what exactly like Mayday means on in Animal Crossing. Like, is it related it's to not labor? Clear. It doesn't seem like it is, no. Um, I mean, obviously, in the real world, May Day is the day that we celebrate the people who work, um, and especially now when, uh, you know, uh, essential workers are so important to keeping us all alive um, and are risking their lives to do it. Um, the, it, it it does seem like none of that carries over <laughs> to Animal Crossing. I mean, I guess in the, like, you, uh, on the most base level... Tom mm-hmm. Nook is like, you deserve a break. So why don't you go to this like labyrinth on a, mm-hmm. uh, it is so Animal Crossing where it's like, why don't you relax by doing this really stressful task that I've set up for you? <laughs> Truth. Um, yeah. So you travel to an island uh, and it is, like you say, a labyrinth where you have to uh, cut down trees and break rocks and dig up stumps and stuff like that. Uh, and you have a limited amount. Of, you can't bring anything to the island. You can't eat anything before you go. It's like swimming. Um, and uh, you have to make your way through this maze. And if you make it through with enough leftover fruit, then you can earn a bunch of extra um, bell vouchers. Or uh, you just make it to Rover and uh, he gives you his suitcase. Which uh, I was expecting Rover's briefcase to like, do something um but no it's just no, sir. a piece it of luggage not. that i'm no. very happy to have but is now just sitting in my house yeah i mean it, it goes right next to my um oh what is his name what is the name of the uh the bunny day rabbit zipper the zipper it goes right next to the zipper bobblehead as like uh, a a trophy that i conquered this holiday and that's all it's gonna be um but like it was fun. I'm all, I'm glad for these like little extra things that are in Animal Crossing. So I will tell you, I saw yesterday on Twitter somebody posted their like Disneyland haunted mansion that they had built in Animal Crossing. Um, yes. Our I was so depressed after watching that because my island is such garbage in comparison, and so it has renewed. No, that's overdone. <laughs> it's overdone, Mark. <laughs> It has renewed my, like, passion to figure out to mm-hmm. something to do with my island, and I don't know what that is yet, but I do know that I'm spending, like, uh, many bells trying to, like, mo- I've been, like, moving houses because I yes. kind of just, like, uh, haphazardly was like, oh, I'll just put houses here, and now I'm like, no, I'm putting them all, the houses are going to go basically in the same area, and then it'll give me tons of room on my island to do something eventually i'll figure out what it is now i have three discrete neighborhoods on my island uh and they all have a different feel to them and they have like different two of them have different paths and the third one has no path at all 
Um, and then my my house, of course, is on top of a mountain uh, in the back of the island, so none of those common animals can uh, <laughs> worm their way up to my front door. Um, but uh, I, I haven't moved a single building other than my house. Um, everything else, uh, I, I've been kind of, uh, I don't know if I just designed well in the beginning or if, uh, like, by the time I got to do terraforming, I was like, uh, figured out a way to make what I had thrown down haphazardly work. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't feel like a huge, I, you know, having done some terraforming and like, um, you know, kind of like widening some paths and, um, like, you know, just doing a little bit of water stuff. Uh, I, I kind of don't want to mess with it too much. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, so I haven't gotten terraforming yet. I haven't, because mm. here, because like I wasn't putting enough stuff outside to like raise the yeah. hearts of my island. Um, well, so we we actually have an email about that. Um, so thank you to uh, one sec here. Thank you to Colin for writing in. Colin says, "Dear Patrick and Mark, uh, I I need your unending Nintendo wisdom on Animal Crossing: New Horizons. I have been stuck on two stars for uh, for most of the time on my island. I feel like everyone has seen KK, the KK Slider concept concert except me. I know you've gotten three stars on your island. Any tips for changing up my island for getting the concert and terraforming? Love the podcast, Colin. P.S. I have Sheldon the squirrel on my island, and he is the best." Uh, uh, Sheldon is the best. I can confirm that. Uh, I love him. One time he asked me if he should leave, and I said no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Mark, tips for getting to three stars and then, therefore, the uh, concert and terraforming abilities. I mean, Colin, let me tell you, I have no clue. Uh, I also have not gotten KK Slider to come to my island yet, so you are not alone. Um, I as But I think that the two big things that I'm working on that I think will help you is you have to invite um, more Islanders. And then yep. two, you have to put stuff outside, which I was, I haven't really done a bunch of. Yeah. Put stuff outside, like make a, like I carved out a, a dumb little area in my Island that like is fenced off. And then there are just like some things in there, right? Like, um, it doesn't really matter what's there, but you put a couple things inside a fenced in area and your villagers, I guess, love it. They think it's an attraction. Um, also, uh, don't, n don't neglect flowers. Um, if you, the more flowers you plant, the just like sort of happier they'll be with like that kind of variety, um, in stuff. I don't really think it matters, um, like where you put things or that it's like an aesthetically like, uh, pleasing set of items that you set up together, but like just find an area to put some things nicely. You know, uh, I, I have um, a an area that I had set up as like the Japanese garden, which doesn't have a lot of stuff in it, but it's there. Um, and, you know, I've, I've got this other little, um, uh, I, I use fences a lot. Um, and I think they, they like the fences uh, an awful lot. So that, that's how I did it. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, another email. Mark, this one is pointed uh, directly at you. Uh, it is from Brian. Uh, Brian writes, uh, well, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure the initial conversation with your new villager wasn't uh, was necessary. The only way to get rid of him is not to interact with him. Think of it like a YouTube algorithm. Negative feedback is still feedback and affects your account positively. According to the Animal Crossing New Horizon source code, a lack of interaction is the best way to get villagers to go voluntarily. So if you, Mark, ignore Huck, the frog that you hate, um, <laughs> from this point forward, after about a week, he will want to move. Only talk to him after you see uh, the dialogue box over his head around the seventh day and, tell uh, and he'll tell you that he's thinking of leaving the island. Agree with him, pop some bubbly, and celebrate his departure. Can I tell you something really distressing? Is that, first of Please. all, thank you, Brian. This was, like, so helpful. I'm very excited uh, to get Huck off of my island. But, okay, the part that I that is freaking me out is that I have two villagers on my island who I like and make points to interact with on a daily basis. And both of them within the past 10 days have been like, hey, I'm thinking of leaving. And I have no idea why. 
But Huck so, just seems yeah, want to want to like hang to around. Like he just loves me not talking to him. He loves not interacting with me. Like that is seemingly what he craves. Like we are at odds, Huck and I. See, I think that the game also just like wants to cycle your villagers out so you will get new neighbors. Um, but I think you always, as long as like you talk to them within a couple days of them deciding that they may want to leave, um, I think they will always take your advice to stay if you tell them to stay. I think. Because um, you know, I, I did have Sheldon say that he was thinking about leaving. Um, and then uh, I, I had, uh, oh, the eagle, whose name I forget now because I let him go. Um, but yeah, anyway, I, I think that's what I, I think that's what I need to do. I think like, look, I hate to say it, but I think some of my islanders are holding my island back, and I've just got to shake things Whoa. up. I need a Whoa. new, you know, island. I'm moving houses. Mm-hmm. I'm deciding on a theme, maybe. <laughs> and look, so having some new, uh, n- some new neighbors may help you decide on a theme that you like. Um, speaking of new neighbors and new characters, um, well, uh, did you like seeing Rover? Because Rover, uh, as, as we discussed, appears on the Mayday Island. Um, it, were you excited to see him? Is that a character that you have some affinity for from previous games? Not really. Okay. Um, <laughs> we got an we got an email sort of along these lines from from these lines uh, from Paul, uh, and he says, "Greetings. Uh, we've all been wondering what could Mister Rossetti do now apart from invisibly operate the rescue app." Which is that? Is that confirmed that he operates the rescue app? Oh, I don't know, actually. But that I never use it. Yeah, I've used it once because I wanted to on the Mayday Island. I wanted to reset mm. so I could um get enough store up enough fruit to like break those rocks at the end. Uh, he says, uh, Paul, Paul says, uh, it just hit me this morning. His primary directive has always been to fight time travel. And he digs tunnels. These are the two pieces of information. He needs to be the chief character for the Groundhog Day event. Next February 2nd, everything should be normal except Mr. Rossetti is in town and grumbling. Then the next day, Isabel announces that it's February 2nd, giving the exact same speech. Rossetti asks you for your help in fixing the timeline. Uh, He's going to succeed regardless, but you can help him each day and you'll get rewards. February 2nd repeats itself with the exact same guests, items, fossils, turnip prices, until Sunday when Mr. Rossetti reveals he fixed it and gives you your rewards just in time for KK Slider's concert. What do you think about that, Mark? I think that's amazing. I uh, love... Mr. Rossetti so much, and I am dying to know how he's going to make an appearance in the game. Um, and it would be worth the year long wait to make something like that happen. <laughs> so here's hoping he comes back as the Groundhog uh, from Groundhog's Day. Any uh, further thoughts about your experience playing Animal Crossing this week, Mark? <laughs> no, but we're dangerously close to this turning into a segment of its own. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't. I don't perceive any danger, but <laughs> but I think it will become its own segment at some point. Uh, Mark, what else have you been playing this week? I played a little bit of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Um, uh-huh. Still working my way through trying to get three stars on every um, cup. Now I'm working on the 150cc class. And look, I made it through one. Um, but there were a couple close calls and there's nothing sadder than making it through yeah. like most of the races. And then on the last race, just like getting hit by a blue shell at an inopportune time and coming in second. That is hard. Yeah, it's brutal. Uh, yeah, I, actually Sarah and I, I didn't, uh, I didn't mark this down on the sheet, but Sarah and I also played a little Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Um, we did just like a, a random 16 course, um, uh, whatever you call it, uh, just like versus uh, the the two of us, because um, we wanted to burn an hour while we watched something on TV. So it it was great. Um, and then you also have down here that you've been playing Super Mario Brothers two. Oh yeah, I just did like on um uh I can't remember some day last week maybe Saturday. I was in the mood to play some like two D Mario levels, and so I went back into uh Super Mario Maker two and was playing a couple of like the story levels that I hadn't finished mm. and like it wasn't really doing it for me. So I went into the NES switch online and uh, booted up some super Mario brothers too. And it'd been a while since I had like played through that game and it's uh, it's super fun. 
yeah that game is a delight um uh, not maybe not as much of a delight i played star fox 2 yesterday uh for a good 45 minutes and i don't believe i'll be going back um it has i i don't remember if during our uh, original star fox episode um we talked much about star fox command um but it, so many of the like the game has a, like an overhead map um uh, star fox uh, uh command as does star fox 2 where you're sort of like uh plotting your course and like intercepting missiles and stuff uh all for these like individual um encounters and all the individual encounters are uh boring and uh rough um so uh you know i had a uh total uh, I won't I wouldn't say change of heart on the original Star Fox. Um, but you know, we had a great time playing it uh for Retro Month. Um, but I cannot say that that extends to Star Fox 2 for me. All right. Uh so that's what we've been playing this week. Let's get into the new releases and what we might be playing next week. So another quieter week for new releases. Um on Thursday, May 7th, Jay and Silent Bob Mall Brawl is being released on the Switch eShop. Um, it's kind of like an 8-bit throwback to beat-em-ups games, uh, but with Jay, starring Jay and Silent Bob, the uh, Kevin Smith creations. Um, so <laughs> what is your... I'm curious, Patrick, mm. your relationship, if any, with the uh, Kevin Smith films. Like, do you... Are you, like... Do you have affinity for Jay and Silent Bob or? Uh, I mean, for the characters of Jay and Silent Bob, uh, like, yes and no. Uh, you know, I, I was young enough to uh, be very into um, like Clerks and uh, Chasing Amy and Dogma. Um, Dogma I saw for the first time the night before my um, confirmation, <laughs> which uh, was a, a nice, like, affirming thing of, like, yes, this is silly. It's okay to feel like this is silly. Um, so uh, that uh, I've, I've always felt close to that. And then I really liked the, um, the Clerks animated series, uh, which ran for six episodes, only, like, three of which aired and totally out of order. Um, on ABC in like 1994 or something. Um, but I mean, I, I largely view Kevin Smith movies as um, bad, but I like some of them anyway. Uh, I can't really say that I like anything that's come out of that corner of uh, like Kevin Smith's uh, output in the last 20 years I've cared about at all. Like you know, I just I it I just don't connect to it anymore. Well, what about you? Yeah, I I don't like. I'm not even sure which Kevin Smith movies I've seen all the way through. Like I I don't really have much relationship with his films or like the characters at all. But one thing I think is really interesting is the fact that like this sort of thing exists. I I think it's interesting in the sense of like where video games are um, compared to the games that they would be aping. Like, uh, video games, you know, in the NES era were so targeted at kids. And now it's like, yeah. Jay and Silent Bob Mall Brawl, it's like, no child is going to have any idea who Jay and Silent Bob are. Like, these are this, these are games that mm -hmm. are squarely aimed at, like, our people our age are, like, a little bit older than us. And, yeah. you know, like, that still makes up a big enough portion of the video gaming, like, world that making a game like this is worthwhile. I mean, it's it's funny because like uh, just last week, uh, Streets of Rage four came out, and I feel like it's the exact same audience, right? Like anyone who was the right age for Streets of Rage when it hit, probably the right age for uh, the Jay and Silent Bob Mall, Mall Brawl, which I'm looking at now, and like the graphics actually are pretty cute, and like they do a good job of rendering the um, Jay and Silent Bob characters in that sort of like Kunio Kun, um, River City Ransom art style. Um, but like, it, and it's kind of cool that they're adhering to that sort of graphical, uh, design, um, and not being, you know, more like an, an, an animated look. Um, it's a game I'll probably never play, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy it's out there. <laughs> I mean, does it, to me, it feels like what it means to be an adult 
now is like so different than what it was like 30 years ago where mm, yeah you know like i feel like when our parents were our age they basically put away this type of i guess you would say like childish things childish things and just yeah and just be like no i don't i don't think don't that's think true so? they just no because they just listen to wings instead of beetles <laughs> and you, you know what i mean like it's just the the vocabulary and the mediums changed but i think the same thing sort of applies that like you know uh, our parents are going to go see Gran Torino because they like uh, Clint Eastwood, you know, like that, that's it. It's, it, it's the same, it's the same kind of thing um, that like we all uh, indulge in the things that we liked when we were younger and just like a different rapper uh, as adults. And I think every generation does that and every generation will do that. Um, all right. Uh, so th those are the new releases. Uh, let's close out this segment. Now it's time for a regular segment on our show. It's time for 433. In 1952, American composer John Cage wrote a piece called 433, wherein a performer or a group of performers didn't play their instruments for 4 minutes and 33 seconds. For the purposes of this show, our instruments are talking about Nintendo. So, for the duration of one performance of 433, Mark and I will talk about something not at all Nintendo-related, thus fulfilling the contract of the piece. Mark, today we are talking about whether we run hot or cold and how that compares or contrasts to our partners. Mark, uh, you posed this question, so I'm going to make you answer first. That is fair. Um, Thank so you. I run cold, generally. <gasps> I feel like I am always cold. I always want to be wearing a hoodie. I always want to be like wrapped uh, okay, in a Okay, right you always blanket. are though. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because I'm always cold. I am always cold. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, to just so that we have established a baseline here, I run hot. I have been wearing shorts since we started quarantine. I have not put pants on. Uh, and... No, look, I am a civilized man. If I were going out in the evening time, I would almost certainly be wearing pants. Um, but since I've been stuck at home and only one other person has to look at me and my fantastic gams, uh, I'm wearing shorts all day long. So uh, my husband generally is like, basically he, his internal body temperature is the opposite of mine. Yes. For whatever reason, so uh, so it does not always work out great. Like when I'm freezing, he's normally like, "Oh man, we got to turn on the air conditioner." And then when I'm like, "Wow, it's way too hot," he's like, "How can you possibly say that? I'm so cold." It doesn't make any sense. So uh, now that's interesting, um, because I uh, Sarah is uh, if I am warm, Sarah Sarah is is cool, um, but. Uh, we are generally on the same page when it's like, is it time to turn the air on? It's time to turn the air on. Great. Um, one place where we don't see eye to eye temperature wise is in the bedroom regarding the fan. Um, I am pointing to the fan uh, above my head right now. I prefer high speeds of fan. I want air blowing around as quickly and as coolly as possible all night long. I want it all night long. Uh, whereas uh, Sarah, and I, this is also maybe a function of she has uh, more hair than I do. So there's more hair to like blow around and disturb her at night. But man, I, I want airflow. I don't ever want it to stop. And she wants it to stop. She wants that hot dead air just hanging over us <laughs> so is it it's the like the movement of the air itself not the temperature that you're looking for so much i mean i'm i i would also like to be cool too like uh there's nothing i like more than a cold room and a warm bed that's how my hus husband is he's like i want it as cold as possible yes. in the room so i can like mm -hmm. be comfortable under the blankets and i'm like this is madness no like I, uh, I do I do not want this. Basically, like I would love to go through life where everything is like perfectly matched to my temp to like my body temperature. 
So it's like when I'm sleeping at night, like I want whether I'm under the covers or outside of the covers, it's all you want it all to be the same. (laughs) Yeah, that's madness. You want to walk through a, a, a temperately a, a immutable sludge your entire <laughs> life? How are you, how are you with showers? What is your what is your shower like? I, for example, I enjoy a hot shower, and I enjoy those hot showers for probably longer than is than is advisable. I really like a hot shower. I mm. I tr- like desperately wish I enjoyed cold showers because I think it'd be so much better for my pores. And so I've tried, I have tried to be like a cold shower person, but it's crazy to me. Oh, I guess we'll uh, never never know. know. Uh, We'll never know more about cold showers. Okay, we were accompanied today by pianist G. Lu. So thank you, G. Lu. All right, Mark, let's get into the news. So we got some news last week about a Nintendo Direct. Um, Yay! Uh, no, unfortunately, the news is that oh. the anticipated E3 Direct has been delayed to, quote, later in the summer um, due to complications related to COVID-19. Now, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, we should just know that from now on, when something is delayed, probably, at least in part, due to COVID-19. <laughs> yeah, I think... That's fair. And even if it's not, it's a good excuse you can always use. The best. Um, so uh what what are, what are, what are, what are your initial reactions to this, Mark? So this is not entirely surprising to me, right? Like on the one hand, you know, Nintendo for the past few years has always had a big Nintendo Direct timed around E3. Um, but oh, by the way, this is all based on reporting from VentureBeat and Eurogamer. Uh, Nintendo obviously has not like announced or confirmed anything. Uh, one of the things I thought was interesting in the, I think it was the Venture Beat article, is they were talking about like, um, uh, just like Japanese business culture and how you know like, uh, work from home for a lot of Japanese companies is something that they have to get like very used to. Um, yeah. In Venture Beat, they were talking about how like. You know, we think of Japan as being very technologically advanced, but a lot of businesses there are still doing business by, like, fax. And it's, you know, like, so much of Japanese business is um, predicated on the idea of being able to do business with a person face-to-face and all that kind of stuff. And so that they're just not really, like, set up or prepared for this swish, swift shift to working at home. And so that is partly what... uh I guess maybe the the speculation is why this is delayed is that as Nintendo is kind of, you know, uh, attempting to shift to this work from home environment that, uh, you know, it's it's, uh, delayed a few things, which I, you know, can appreciate. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also uh, just a a little bit of... You know, uh, the the big release that we've had so far this year from Nintendo is obviously Animal Crossing. Um, But that was one that we originally had slated to be on the calendar for last year um, and was delayed like around E3 was when we finally found out about it um, being delayed to the next year. Um, So like in some ways, they're still sort of paying off the promises of uh, 2019 um, now. So like I think they're a little bit behind their schedule anyway and had such a big year last year of their like sort of partner relationships like intelligent systems and the pokemon company game freak i guess um and uh you know like astral chain and um marvel ultimate alliance they had all these big games that came out and had uh nintendo characters in them um or were exclusive to nintendo platforms but were still like you know it's not necessarily them like i think we are just seeing uh, the sort of momentum catch up to um, Nintendo now. And yeah, maybe it's also harder for them to get everything together and present what they wanted to for this year um, at, in time for the E3 window. Um, but also, you know, it's just uh, Nintendo's a big company, but it's not a huge company. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I actually kind of feel like last year was not like a real like momentum uh like yeah like there wasn't like a ton of momentum to last year i i felt like it had 
good releases and like a number of like big third party releases. You know, that like you mentioned, like the Marvel Ultimate Alliance and Astral Chain and stuff like that. But all of that again feels like partner relationships that wouldn't really affect yeah. like Nintendo's like own internal work schedule. Um, obviously shifting Animal Crossing from the fall to March of this year had like I'm sure ripple effects down the road. Um, but if anything, it seems like it would have bought them time to be ahead of where they are and not, you know, like push things back. Um, but to your point, yeah, like, I mean, who we, knows? Yeah. Yeah. Who, yes, exactly. This is, we'll, we will never know. <laughs> also, Mario Maker 2 came out last year and uh, Luigi's Mansion 3. But I guess, like, the question is, you know, if we don't expect to see it in June along with everything else... Um, what again, the reports were saying that Nintendo was telling its partners, go ahead and announce whatever you want to, whatever you are like planning to announce as part of this, like whenever you mm. want to, um, you know, and, you know, we're saying later in the summer, but I'm sure all of that again is tentative based on, you know, how things shake out. I do wonder, you know, how this could potentially delay announcements for things we knew were supposed to be coming pretty soon. Like uh, the new arms character for Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, um, like it's it's possible that we would have seen that at like a June direct if that happened, but maybe now it'll just come out separately, like we've seen with the Animal yeah. Crossing update or the uh, uh, Mario Maker Two update from just a few weeks ago. Yeah, well, and they specifically uh, called out June as the date uh, during the last Nintendo Direct, uh, as June, June being the day that they were going to reveal who the ARMS character was. And at that time, I was like, oh, they're going to reveal who it is, and he's going to be available that day. Like, that's sort of the, the cadence that, they're, that they had been doing these things on. Um, but yeah, so now I wonder if that means that character will be delayed um, or what. Um, there was a, a, a mention of... Um, so in uh, Famitsu this last week, um, Masahiro Sakurai has his bi-weekly column, and he mentioned that uh, he, he and his team are continuing to um, work and work well uh, during work-at-home stuff. Um, so you know, even if uh, the rest of Japanese business culture is having a difficult time adapting, it seems like Sakurai and his team are still plugging away at Smash Ultimate. So... Uh, you know, that uh, maybe won't be part of a big direct, but I, I bet we still see something about Smash in June. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, especially because, I mean, anything could be delayed, but because when they uh, showed it, they did say June, which means that at the time they must have been pretty confident on um, how development was going. Yeah. Uh, another thing that wasn't in here, but I just wanted to call out, like talking about COVID-19 related delays is, you know, Game Developers Conference was supposed to be happening uh, in March and then it got canceled slash um, delayed until the like August when they were going to do uh, GDC summer or whatever it was going to be called. And it was just announced last week that they are taking that completely online. So any plans for like an in-person game developers conference has been canceled this year. Um, it'll now be like an entirely online event. Yeah, uh, which is interesting. Although I let, let's get into the the next uh, topic on the news here because I think it folds into all of this. Right, because like uh, you know, one of the things we saw when E three got canceled is um, the ESA saying like, hey, we're not going to do an online event this year. And we've seen a bunch of different online events spring up. IGN announced that they were doing something in June. GameSpot just recently announced that they were doing something, I think also in June, if not sometime this summer. And then maybe the biggest one, um, Game in Event in uh, Impresario, Jeff Keighley uh, has announced the Summer Game Fest uh, which is like an um, umbrella that he's doing that's going to run from May to August of this year. A huge amount of time. A, a span of four months of uh, being excited about video game announcements is what uh, is being proposed here. Yeah, and it seems like it is like the type of stuff we would see from his show or during E3 where it's like interviews and 
um, first impressions and all that kind of stuff. But he's also saying that uh, working with Xbox and Steam, uh, that they are going to be doing like limited time demos and like hands on type things. And like, so I think that's like really interesting. I also saw that it's it's in collaboration with I am 8 bit, right? Um, yeah, and which... I, I am 8 bit had been working with uh, the ESA on the creative identity of E3 for this year before I am 8 bit backed out. Right, which would happen even before E3 was like canceled. And then Jeff Keighley had mm-hmm. also like a couple of weeks or months yep. after I am 8 bit left, like Jeff Keighley also said that he wasn't going to be working with E3 for this year. So it, it's interesting how that like turn, they obviously liked working with each other. And um, yeah. how like that turned into something else? Yeah. So it's. Uh, I mean, I guess no one really knows right now because you know the the range from May to August means that a lot of different events are sort of swallowed up by this, including uh, GDC, like you mentioned before. Um, a little bit of uh, like Gamescom sort of takes place in that same uh, time period. Obviously, like the digital. Um, they're both. Uh, IGN and GameStop's uh, events are in that same uh, window. Um, So, like, I don't know. I'll be interested to see what, like, how many exclusive announcements could there be to be shared among these different platforms? Yeah, like, how do you differentiate each one? Like, how do you make it... I Look, one of the things that was so nice and fun about E3 is that it was just, like, Mm -hmm. a week of everybody doing their thing. And spreading this type of stuff out, like, over a lot of events is totally fine. But then it, how, at what point does it just become, like, the regular news cycle? Yeah, to 100%. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's sort of, that's sort of how, how I'm feeling, too, is, like, how is this not just, like, the video game news? Like, how is it not just the death of, <laughs> uh, like, video game conferences and event seasons? Like, it's just all summer. Yeah, and, like, the, you know, what IGN is doing and what GameSpot are doing like it, it's a more concentrated event so in theory it can kind of have that e3 spirit where it's like hey for this week we're going to blow out like all this exciting stuff yeah doing it yeah. over like the course of a really long like the entirety of summer basically um yeah it'll just be really interesting to see how something like that pans out um it is also interesting so when it was announced keely said uh said like hey for phase one, here are the companies that are like participating, and there were a Iron bunch Man, of... Iron Man two, <laughs> Captain America. There are like a bunch of companies listed. Nintendo was not one of them. So does that mean that like for phase one, whatever that is, Nintendo is not participating, or is Nintendo just not participating in any of them? Like we didn't see them in the announcement for IGN's thing. Um, maybe yeah, they're just not actively participating in any of these this year it's also possible that nintendo is participating but they are like hey don't put our name on that don't put our name on that thing like you know we'll we'll roll we'll have a trailer for you at some point but like don't put our name on it yeah so yeah i guess just like with everything else it will be interesting to see how all of this unfolds and then what it looks like next year Right, because like if this is a success, how does this continue to like grow and become its own thing? Yeah, I mean, it's especially because like we're going to need a solution for conventions next year as well. Even if we are, you know, all comfortably going to the store and going back into work and whatever, like conventions are still going to be uh, tricky until we have like a a vaccine. So, um, you know, by this time next year, we'll still need uh, something to replace E three. And then does E3 ever come back? And why would E3 ever come back? Right. And uh, I, the thing that I love about Jeff Keighley's event and that I hope like the promise of it turns out to be what it actually is, is I love the idea of like the democratization of these demos, like these like exclusive hands-on. And clearly it'll change how game developers have to like develop this type of stuff. Like because it'll be so consumer facing, it'll have to be more mm-hmm. like a beta than, you know, some of potentially some of like the hands on that you would get at E3 otherwise. But really I've never played anything on the floor at E3 that what that couldn't just be a demo for like users. Like I've never played anything rough. Yeah, I guess I've never played anything super rough either. And honestly, like, 
it would have been more fun to play that Pokemon Sword and Shield demo without someone standing behind me being like, do you know about types? And I'm like, I don't, <laughs> don't want to do this. <laughs> Uh, there's been a huge amount of internal Nintendo information that's been leaking over the past like few weeks, and it was never really clear if it was where it was coming from or exactly. Like we've talked about some of the Pokemon um, like beta releases or like source code that people have dug in and found like stuff about Pokemon Yellow and a potential Pokemon Pink and like all that kind of stuff. Um, more recently, there's been like full on source code code dumps for older systems, uh, N64 demos that were internal to Nintendo that had never been released before. Like all of this stuff, I cannot stress enough, is like ill gotten. Um, yeah. But some of it is interesting. So we're going to treat these weeks leaks like WikiLeaks. And we're going to condemn the people who got the information, but we're also going to talk about the information. Right. So, uh, like, this past week, um, it at least became widely known that basically anything you ever wanted to know about the Nintendo Wii, like, the how it works, the programming of it, uh, is all out there now. Um, all, but in, it that part has been attributed. It seems like, at least for this, that it didn't come directly from Nintendo, that somebody hacked... Um, a company called Broad On, which is now known as like Acer Cloud Computing, which is a company that Nintendo hired to like help develop the Wii and other consoles and systems. Um, and so part of the leak is this like uh, PowerPoint presentation that was created internally to sell people on the idea of like Nintendo Wi-Fi connection. And there's like a slide in there that's been getting a lot of attention that I thought was super interesting that is about the friend code. The infamous friend codes. Right, because like everybody, you know, bags on Nintendo for not having very sophisticated online. And, you know, from the moment that the friend code was announced, it's been, you know, kind of like the go-to example of how backwards Nintendo's online infrastructure is. Um because every other platform uses a, uh, you know, it, you're recognized by your screen name. And if your friends want to search for you, they can search for you by your screen name. Um, and so you probably still need to communicate to someone what your screen name is because everyone has, uh, you know, something, something different that they like to use as their screen name. But, uh, you know, once you communicate that to them, they probably know it. Um, and don't need to ask you for it again, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So one thing that they really focused on in this um, presentation was they talk about like the, especially in the Wii era, Nintendo was all about like, how do we get the most people playing online? Like, how do we get the most people enjoying games? And so they really focused on like this idea of like, how do we make connecting online feel simple and safe to people? So the thought, the part that I thought was interesting, there's one slide that talks about the friend code, and it says like, uh, "We are com- we're going to use friend codes," and uh, you know, initially there were opinions that like, "Hey, instead of using this like string of twelve digits, people should just be able to choose a screen name, and that's how you find them." But they delineate in the slide why they decide to not go this way, and this is what I think is so interesting is one there's a high probability of duplicate screen names. And so when this happens, it takes you multiple tries to find a screen name that works for you. And sometimes it's like, yeah, like if you, unless you're there day one, your chosen screen name is probably not going to be in existence. So you have to either choose something else or you have to like append digits to it. And they didn't want to do this because they thought it conflicted with the simplicity, with their simple principle. And then the second part is that they also felt like it was possible to guess someone's screen name by trying variations of their actual name. And they thought this conflicted with like the idea that people would be comfortable getting online and potentially interacting with strangers. Um, so it was, it's re- it was so interesting to me to see it's like, yeah, like friend codes were not a like limitation. They were s- self-imposed because Nintendo yeah. was like, what can we do to make playing online with friends simpler? and make people who otherwise would not want to connect with strangers feel safe in doing so. And so they were like, yeah, 
great. We're not going to we're not going to do screen names. We're going to do this like 12 digit code thing. And then people can make their nickname or whatever, whatever they want. And it doesn't matter if there's duplicates because it's always tied back to this code that never changes. Yeah, well, and I, I like that in uh, the modern, like in, in the uh, swi- the Switch uh, uh, application of this, that um, you can still connect your uh, Nintendo friend code, your Switch, uh, you know, 12-digit number, to uh, your Twitter account and your Facebook account. And then if you have other people uh, on your friends list on Twitter or people who mutually f- that you follow and who follow you on Twitter, that they also have linked their accounts that you can become friends that way. Um, so like, well, you still have that sort of like comfort of uh, comfort and simplicity of the friend codes. Um, there's even like the extra ease of use of if someone follows you on Twitter and you follow them, then you can uh, become friends that way too. Yeah, I definitely feel like it's like evolved in the right direction. Totally. Um, and, and I can tell you as somebody whose name is like so common, there are millions of Mark Mitchells in the world yeah. that like I can totally appreciate this idea of somebody having a duplicate screen name and so you're chosen one. Like I cannot tell you how finding a Gmail like <laughs> name account yeah. was like such a nightmare. Um cuz every variation on Mark Mitchell has is like taken. Um and so yeah, yeah. like well, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, just uh, uh, like honestly, all of my friends screen names like uh, on uh, like the PlayStation Network or whatever, if I I would need to know exactly what their screen name is anyway. Like if I want to find my friend Andrew, I have to know, and I know. Okay, I just thought of it. I just thought of what his screen name is because I like had to think through it. But if I didn't already have that information, I would need him to text it to me anyway. So like, it's almost the same as having the the friend codes, except it's harder for like a person to remember their own, I guess. I think what I really appreciated about this is like, um, I think it's really easy when you see a decision that like a company makes to just like do the knee jerk reaction of like, oh, like it's so stupid or like, why did they do that? Like Nintendo doesn't understand online. They don't care about online. And, you know, it's Nintendo does not talk about stuff like this. Like they've never presented friend codes and said, hey, like, this is the reason we made these decisions. They're, you know, just like, uh, yeah, we think friend codes are a great way for people to, like, connect with each other online and, uh, you know, like, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, I think it just goes to show that, like, you know, like, m- most of the time comp- when companies are making decisions like that, it's, like, really thoughtful and there's, like, a reason they decided to go that way. And it doesn't always make sense. And so it's interesting to see these, like, peaks behind the curtain where you're, like, oh, like, I get where they're coming from. Like, that's so interesting. They, like, saw this problem, and it's not that they didn't, like, think of it. It's that they, like, were trying to solve for something else. Yeah. Um, Patrick, when we yes. ever see Nintendo's uh, next Nintendo Direct, do you think we're going to get an announcement of Mother 3 being localized outside of Japan? Um, Mark? I would say that the chances are incredibly low that we will see (laughs) Mother 3 being announced as being localized to the West. But there is some reason to be excited about Mother in general. Yeah, so there's something called the Hobonichi Mother Project, uh, which just announced the first of several products uh, related to the Mother series. One is a book containing... Which is Earth, Earthbound, by the way. That's uh, Right, that's, uh, yeah. That, oh, that's right. Yeah, the yeah. only... Oh, I guess we've seen Mother... What What was the remastered? Like, what did they call that when it got Re- Mother Reborn or something? So, uh, yeah, I, I forget. Or was but it just it's called like Mother? The, Am I like... No, no. They, they it's, it's Earthbound Beginnings is what it's called. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Is the sort of like remaster of Mother 1. Um, and Earthbound, as we know it, is Mother 2, and Mother 3 we've never seen. Right. It came out for the GBA um, in Japan, but has never mm-hmm. been released outside of that country. Um, but as part of the Hobonichi Mother Project, they are beginning to compile and are planning to release a book containing every line of dialogue from all three games, which I think is such an interesting thing to put out there. It. I don't 
understand this move? Like, how many little boxes of dialogue are you going to see that are just like, good morning? Like, <laughs> there's going to be so much, like, garbage filler in this that's not going to make any sense or have any sort of resonance. But it just, like, is in there for the sake of... uh being able to say it has all the dialogue from all three mother games in it yeah and if you're like a big fan of the series and that's something that you know like like what a cool thing for somebody to just compile and now it's all out there um both the site and the twitter account that announced it are uh in japanese so it's unclear if this book will uh ever be like translated or you know be released outside of japan but maybe it's another thing that we can continue to tweet at reggie yep there we go. <laughs> Even though he's not working for Nintendo anymore, when are you bringing <laughs> the Hoban AG Mother Project uh, dialogue book to the West? Um, pa- Patrick, as part of yesterday's May the 4th Star Wars Day celebration, and once again, happy May the 5th be with you. <laughs> Um, Thank you. <laughs> Star Wars. Cinco de Mayo. It's already a, a holiday. <laughs> like. uh, StarWars.com revealed the box art for Lego Star Wars, the Sty- Skywalker saga. Something that I keep forgetting is coming out, even though we saw like a uh, um, gameplay of it at E3, and it looked really fun. Yeah, um, this is one that I have been sort of like low key looking forward to uh, since E3, because as you mentioned, we did see. Um, we, we did we weren't able to play it, but you know we were in the, a small room where they were showing off um, uh, the Skywalker Saga stuff, and like it's this is not just a collection of uh, Star Wars Lego games. They, this is a new game built from the ground up um, that uses all the Star Wars characters and locations from the nine like main saga films, um, and seems really cool and really dynamic and like objective based, um, and not just like you know collecting uh lego bits or whatever they are uh in a normal lego game yeah so as part of like revealing the box art they also had an interview with the game's head of production and strategic director jonathan jonathan smith and then lucasville games managing producer craig derrick um patrick do you want to be jonathan or craig (laughs) <laughs> i like this um I'll, I'll be craig okay i will be jonathan um okay so uh, this is me not talking as mark anymore and i am now talking mm-hmm. as jonathan starting i mean i will be transformed you will know i'm playing a character right. and and when and the next words that i say i will be craig derrick and again transformed you will know it but like just to, to prepare you <laughs> starting now as fans We were always going to go big. With the conclusion of the Skywalker saga in Episode 9 and 15 years since the first Lego Star Wars, it really felt like the right time to aim as high as possible to create a Lego landmark. Hold for applause. Look, if you had one shot or one opportunity to build Lego Star Wars game from the ground up that brings all nine films in the Skywalker saga together for the first time in one moment, would you capture it or let it slip? And I'm pausing a second just to point out that it sounds a little bit like he's Eminem and he's going to start to rap. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, all knew, uh, we all knew early that to do this right, that we had to do it well and to respect what has come before while bringing new elements to the franchise. We needed the game to feel epic in scope and scale while bringing the player intimately closer to the action like never before. This required new technology, new game mechanics, and a passionate team of developers to create a cast of hundreds and all the familiar worlds they populate. With all the charm and humor you expect from Lego, from a LEGO Star Wars game, quite frankly, this game is, is as massive as... Be- it is massive because it has to be. And scene. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was that, um yeah, congrats. Yeah. That was amazing. I just wanted to give you like congratulations. And at your if you go out for a commercial audition, you should totally use this as your monologue. Th- this is my monologue, actually. So it's th- thank you for saying so. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's basically just to underline the point that uh what we should expect to see from this game is not uh, another Lego game is not just another Lego Star Wars compilation because you know like they had done those uh, previously and almost became like sort of a running joke of like how many different times are they going to package these things together and present them as a new game I think what this is slash will be and they're still saying sometime this year um, 
is going to be a, a brand new Lego Star Wars experience. I'm I'm really excited for this game. Yeah, I remember the like area that they showed off at E3 last year was it was Tatooine, but it was like Tatooine as we've never seen it in a Lego Star Wars game before. Like it was very open world almost like you could run yeah. around and interact with the environment and um it'll just be really interesting i i you know f- however you felt about episode nine um it is exciting to me to think of the skywalker saga as this like nine part epic totally and i'm excited to see that like in game form also like and <laughs> again however you feel about episode nine I think they did write a pretty good video game in episode nine. You know what I mean? Like there are a lot of impressive like battle spaces and interesting matchups in cool locations that like, I think it will be fun to ride those weird horse things. I think it'll be fun to, you know, shoot down a a cruiser with force lightning. I think it'll be cool to, you know, channel the spirit of all the Jedi (laughs) against uh, Emperor Palpatine. Like that sounds cool. Like that, that'll be a, fun video game yeah and i'm totally into lego like bulio give me lego bulio and claude yeah i'm super into it wait bulio what's bulio bulio was the uh the guy at the very beginning the alien at the very beginning who the um, slug guy no 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 no. that's claude (sighs) bulio is the one who um thank you uh when uh Poe and Finn are like on that ice planet at the very beginning and yeah. they're getting data from they're getting like something from a uh uh from the spy. resistance like spy like the spy I'll go win that war. Uh, yes, that's Bulio. <laughs> that's Bulio. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> it's just Julio with a B. <laughs> <laughs> it's Star Wars baby. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Uh, last week, April 28th, saw the surprise release of Indivisible, the latest game from Skull Girls developer Lab Zero Games. The release of the action RPG even came as a surprise to the developer and to publisher 505 Games, which is what? <laughs> it's Okay, a lot of things happening here. Indivisible is uh, the, the newest game from the Skull Girls developer. Skull Girls was a uh, hand-drawn 2D uh, fighter, um, like really deep fighting engine kind of based on the uh, like Street Fighter or SNK style fighters. Um, but just, you know, built up from the ground up, all, all, all new, like their, their own IP is great and super fun. And I love it. Um, but that this game, uh, was originally slated for April 28th and then they delayed it, uh, so that they could like time it with a day one patch. Uh, but I guess whoever had the final say at the, like the switch, um, just published it anyway. Uh, so the game is available right now. It doesn't have its day one patch available, but it's there if you want it. And so the day one patch will be coming when it was supposed to be released sometime. Which in I'm the not really sure when exactly that is. <laughs> right. And maybe they sometime didn't even know May. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But so the, perf- the update will add a frame rate toggle option, uh, 180p dock support, uh, roadie. Don't know what that is. Uh, performance updates and localization changes. So you can buy it now, or you can wait for the day one patch. Um, Indiegogo it should be backers. Noted that right now, the the, yeah. the game is like ten percent off uh, right now. So if you want to get it now uh, and save a couple bucks, um, I think it's normally thirty, and uh, it might even be twenty percent off because I feel like I, I saw it for less than twenty five. In any event, um, it, it's cheaper if you buy it now. And then Indiegogo campaign backers, um, they haven't received their digital keys yet, um, but they uh, promise that they're working to fulfill them as soon as possible. And again, when you weren't expecting the game to be out, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, but like it is. And it, this is just another one of those things that like Cooking Mama Cookstar is like, what's going on? Like, why, <laughs> why are games coming out and the publishers are like, oh, this game is out? <laughs> Maybe it's like one of those like scheduled tweets that, yeah. you know, companies like set and then they're like, oh, no, we like. <laughs> oh, no, Kobe Bryant that. died. We can't tweet that. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And, but then it goes out anyways. Like this is the equivalent of that. Potentially. 
I have no idea. I have no information. <laughs> um, the recently kickstarted Wonderful 101 remastered will be, doesn't that feel like a kajillion years ago, will be yeah. delayed in its physical package. Uh, the retail version will be on shelves June 30th in North America and July 3rd in Europe. Um, the digital version is still on track for a May 19th release date with digital backers getting codes as early as May 7th, so just later this week. Um, may the 7th be with you, everyone who's getting... <laughs> Wonderful 101 remastered. And a uh, uh, happy May night, May the 19th be with you to everyone who is just getting it regular. Uh, also, some Kickstarter rewards will be delayed as well. Um, again, COVID-19. COVID, what are you going to do? COVID, baby. <laughs> uh, speaking of, unsurprisingly, Evo 2020, the annual fighting game competition in Las Vegas, has been canceled. Uh, tickets to the event will be refunded, and the organizers have announced that a digital event will take its place, but we'll have to wait for details on exactly what that entails. Yeah, and I'll I'll be interested to see if they have some way of... Because, like, online play it, for fighting games is uh, such a different experience to uh, local competitive play, um, just because, you know, any amount of latency uh, transforms a fighting game, like, entirely. Uh, so it'll be, you know, to the point where... Um, people play with wired controllers instead of wireless controllers because they don't want to have that split second of lag between when you hit the button and the button being read by the game. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what kind of solution they have for this. Uh, and if it even involved, like, I, yeah, I just have no idea what this could possibly be or look like. Yeah, totally. And I, I also feel like by the, like, who knows where things are going to be in you know, like six weeks or three months. So possibly at this point, like maybe you can have a small group of people like get together in a physical location. And then those two people can do like, you know, can go up against each other. And, yeah, but totally. most of it is streamed online. Like, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see. Like, I know that uh, uh, Summer Games Done Quick uh, a couple of weeks ago, like they announced that they were delaying till August, but they had, and I think with hopes of doing an in-person event, but they also had just done an online, uh, like on short notice f fundraiser for COVID-19 relief. And that was all streamed from people's homes. So like does summer's game done quick, like also do something different. It'll, it, it's just going to be so interesting to yeah. see how all of these events evolve because they're going to have to, if they continue to exist. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's interesting because like a summer games done quick or like any of the games done quick don't require like that. You could still have an individual person playing the game and like their relationship to the game doesn't have to be through like a uh, an online connection. But I guess like it would make sense that you could do a one-on-one -on -one, like fighting game tournament where people are all bringing their own fight sticks anyway. Um, and then like you just have one PlayStation hooked up to two TVs and have those TVs, you know, 10 feet apart from each other. And then the players are, you know, a good 12, 14, 15 feet apart from each other. Um, and you wouldn't be violating any like social distancing uh, practices like it does seem like it could still come together in the form of a uh, like a live event um, that just the spectator part of it is all taken online yeah it totally changes the economics like 100%. yeah totally yeah. yeah um well and finally there are some interesting additions to the my nintendo account gold and platinum rewards uh, if you happen to still be playing your Nintendo 3DS, which is a good system that sometimes I badmouth unfairly because um, my <laughs> eyes are just like tired at the end of the day. So I don't want to stare at something just a couple of, you know, like inches away from my face. Yeah. And, you know, in in a time when we're talking about so many things being delayed or like even announcements of things being delayed, um, that uh, it is cool to know that there are some pretty heavy hitter 3DS games. Um, that are that you can get for cheaper using uh, your uh, rewards that you are passively earning in the background all the time anyway. Yeah, like especially platinum points, I feel like I'm lousy with those and I never have anything to spend them on. Uh, but so th there's some new platinum points rewards, including 30% off Star Fox 64 3D, which actually I'm kind of excited about because after um, Star Fox on the SNES, you know, like 
Star Fox 64 is the gold standard of that series. So that would be fun to go back to. Uh, Mario Kart 7 is also 30% off. And then Mario and Luigi Dream Team. Yeah, then and for... that's just a matter of, of spending uh, some platinum points. Um, uh, and then you get the, the 30% off. And then for gold point rewards, you get 30% off Kid Icarus Uprising, Metroid Samus Returns, and Mario Sports Superstars. Which, again, all like heavy hitters or like unique gaming experiences um kid icarus uprising you this kid icarus uprising is like uh the virtual boy and that we are never going to see anything like it from nintendo ever again um so like if you ever want to play that game you can do it now for quite a bit cheaper uh metroid samus returns hey there hasn't been a new metroid game in how long except for this one and this one's a pretty good one uh this is the most recent game that i got 100 percent of everything um which is not something i do so i uh heartily endorse endorse uh samus returns uh, all right, so that's going to do it for the uh, for the news. Let's get out of this. And in fact, that's going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Remember, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. If you like the episode, you can share us on Facebook or Twitter or wherever you share stuff. On Twitter, I'm at Patrick underscore Ellers. Mark is at MKE Mitchell, and the show is at Nin Cart Society. And our 12-digit uh, friend codes are in the episode description of every episode. You can also check out our Facebook page, which is just Nintendo Cartridge Society. Olivia Duncan made our logo. Our theme music is provided by Ape Betty. You can get more of his music, including his cover of Prince's Nothing Compares to You on apebetty.com, or you can listen right now. From my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Ellery saying thank you for listening. My name is Will Himes, and I am a ghostwriter, meaning I write other people's books for them. And I have a podcast called I Will Write Your Book, which are recordings of my meetings with my eccentric clients, such as a woman blocked after one sentence of a children's book about her dogs, a romance novelist who dislikes sex, and a man proud of having sampled everything in his local grocery store. This podcast has been described as fully improvised, played by some of the best comedians on the planet Earth. Hey, that's pretty good. That's I Will Write Your Book on Campfire Media. Campfire.